Begut ran the whole school, Dr. Jim Brown, a glowered got on. Ach, er dus, but why not? Boik was raw. The officer and will on talk to run the heron, Michael Lee Higgins, August the man, Sabina, on show Mochid Dagilla, the Vunu, Eilis Lim, on Tranona show. August not will shade the Queen to Arash the Walla on show. My name is Pat Dolan. I am director of the Institute for Life Course and Society. And along with my colleagues here, we are thrilled and excited to have the President of Ireland here, who is back home and back in his home here, to give us the inaugural lecture. It's my pleasure now to call on the President of the University, Dr. Jim Brown, to make opening remarks and welcome uh, President E. Higgins. Gormaga Pat, Oaktron Nahern, Bankela, Higgin, Karja, Akolaka, Agasina Galer, while her Medus Fodge Fero of Burroy Galer, Gian Okot Suns of Shaw, Agus Mujang Sholu, and Series Han Tog of Shaw. Let me first of all welcome all of you here this evening to this, what, to what is the a very important new lecture series, the inauguration of a set of lectures for the Institute of Life Course and Society. Pat's intention, and I think it's a tremendous idea, is to have a biennial lecture of the quality that we will have tonight, I am sure, and to use that, in effect, to advance the agenda of this Life Course Institute. I'm delighted that President Higgins has agreed to do the inaugural lecture. I think he's probably the most appropriate person I could imagine to do that role, given his history in this university, given his role in social science here over many, many years. I think Pat, you could not have chosen a better, a better speaker. So, Falter wrote the book to one, I was going to make our up, Vehensha, Lin, and Pranona. So, let me say a few words about ILAS before the lecture. This represents, for this university, a milestone in our commitment to applied social sciences. We have had a long commitment to that space, but I think our investment in this facility and our support as a university for a whole series of activities within that, and they're all listed behind the President there on that very fine display. All of that, I think, speaks volumes for our commitment as a university to applying social sciences in order to ensure the very best public policy and the very best implements to advance social policy in our country. This institute will engage with a whole range of issues from <coughs> ageing populations, youth and family support, disability policy, dementia, autism, health economics and other issues, all of which relate to public policy. Let me just give you some sense of the background to this centre. It brings together 150 researchers across the institution, across the Business School and the College of Arts, Social Sciences and Celtic Studies. It draws together policies and policy areas. It draws together a commitment to engage with policy makers to ensure the very best evidence base for policy. It also seeks to identify the best practices based on, based on, on experience and evidence the best, implement, the best, if you like, practice in terms of how we go about solving social problems. Ultimately, it represents an investment by the University of 9 million euros in this facility alone. And that investment was heavily supported by Atlantic Philanthropies and the Galway University Foundation. And I'm very grateful to it. I'm very grateful to both of them for that support. However, it's not something new for the university. Our commitment to applied social science goes back a very long time. And in fact, Coincidentally, this night last week, I had the pleasure of launching a new book, a memoir by a former academic of this institution, Professor Laura Sanulan. Many of you of a certain generation will remember him, I'm sure, and Tukdong will remember him. We launched that book last week, and that book is really the work of an academic of the very first order, a man who's a public intellectual in his day, a man whose work had significant impact on social and public policy. And I think he represents a tremendous exemplar for us of what is possible in this university and what in fact has now become, as I would think, a hallmark of our university. Let me give you a quotation from his book, which I think some of you would find interesting, especially those of you who perhaps are here more years than you care to remember. Let me quote an extended piece from his book. So I quote from Laura Ross's book. During the winter of 1965-66, I had a visit on my home front, a prominent member of the recently formed Save the West movement which was concerned with the chronic underdevelopment of the West of Ireland, with its long-standing unemployment and social problems, 
its consequent high emigration and breakdown of small communities. He was principal of a small primary school in the town of Newport in West Mayo. He approached me on behalf of the County Mayo Board of the Save the West Association and asked me would I carry out some basic research work on the problems of underdevelopment in the West. He offered to pay for my research and the report. I told him I would gladly carry out such a project and without any payment whatsoever, but I would first have to check and talk on the subject with colleagues of mine in the UCG, whom I knew to have a deep concern with the social and economic problems of the West. I would get in touch with him and his movement very soon. At a meeting of the Faculty of Arts, a motion was proposed by Father O'Hein, recommending that a social science research unit should be established in the university. And I was one of the founder members of that social sciences research unit, which I believe is, still exists in the university, and I welcome colleagues from that unit to our university this evening. That's the end of the quotation. What I suggest to you is that initiative, 50 years ago, more or less to the month, with that initiative were sown the seeds of the development of a defining aspect of this university's activity, one which now sees itself expressed in the investment we've made in this facility, the huge work of our academics across a whole range of areas, all of which I think are inspired by that type of thinking. And I know that my colleagues from the SSRC here will be, will be, will I think will be pleased to, to, to have that connection made. They are part of a long tradition in this university, working in applied social sciences and civic engagement. And I would suggest that public policy is now firmly engaged in our university with the creation of a College of Business, Public Policy and Law. Indeed, applied social sciences and under economics underpin two flagship institutes here, the Institute for Life, Course and Society and the Whitaker Institute. Indeed, our Community Knowledge Initiative brings civic engagement, service learning and student volunteering to the very heart of our university and it's something which I think is a defining issue for us and for our students. I think our researchers, our academics and our university leadership concern ourselves with how the academy can support civic and social development. And the Institute for Life Course and Society, I think, stands as the culmination of that tradition of civic and social engagement, of which the university can be quite proud. So let me, let me conclude then by thanking you all for being here for this, the first, the inaugural lecture. I'm delighted that our Dr. on the Heron is here to give it. I think, as I said, nobody could have chosen a better speaker. And I certainly look forward to hearing what Dr. has to say. So let me pa pass over then to our colleague, Dr. on the Heron, distinguished academic, a former faculty member, and a great friend of this university. A Dr. on. Tronus, a coger in Giddle, Chester Brunner, and Mark with me, Mwilari, we couple in the head of Jennifer Marcus Nerev Nart, and a tokakum at a gullivu at a Brunner and Fuishin. A president, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm absolutely delighted to be back uh, in, in Galway, in Inuai Galway. To Jack Rickham Fuss and Tidula Carrer. Uh, in UIG, okay, UCG. <laughs> May I first of all uh, say what well, it is a matter of the, the greatest congratulation uh, to be in such a splendid building, dedicated as it is to the work of social sciences in all of their breadth and depth. And uh, I was delighted as well uh, to see the language that is used in the Institute for Life Course and Society. These are important words, and I very much want to pay tribute to all of the component parts. Uh, Pat Dolan, of course, uh, the UNESCO professor, uh, and also those who are working in wonderful areas, social gerontology and disability, and autism, and all of those other areas. Uh, to have all of these particular interests under uh, one splendid roof uh, is a great chief in itself. Uh, allow me uh, to say, therefore, uh, something about uh, this point of continuity to which the President has made reference already. Um, uh, the 50th anniversary of uh, the National University of Ireland Galway's Social Science Research Centre. Uh, we were in the grammar school, uh, which was a ramshackle building falling apart, 
uh, and uh, among those of us who were in those early uh, recipients of grants was myself. Uh, I remember, I want to say just about the thinking that was behind it. Uh, I think the, the, the president of the university has it right. I, I've read Laura Osanulo, the book on Laura Osanulo's biography, and he was an inspirational man, but I think we should never forget about how he came to be here. Uh, he was born in Manchester uh, from uh, Irish English parents. Uh, he joined the Michael Davitt branch of the Labour Party in, 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 uh, in, in Manchester. He said about his big interest always was the charters. And uh, he was chosen very early, or he learned Irish. And he's, in that branch of Conor Nagalia, he would be chosen uh, to give the, the, the annual lecture for the Manchester Martyrs. Uh, and he, he came then to work in the civil service in Dublin. And the, press, the professor of economics was Limo Bukna, and he applied uh, for a job which was advertised. And of course, he was able to give his lectures in both Irish and English as the people who were appointed at that, that time. Uh, Lars was an extraordinary man. He regularly uh, suggested that he was found at Clona Public there in, uh, uh, in, in, in Galway. In fact, actually, he, he was a member of the, the South East branch in, in, in Dublin City, but he was the last surviving member of the national executive of Clona Public there. Uh, and uh, I was his student, uh, among other things, for, for particularly interested in what he to say about the emergence of the Industrial Revolution in Britain, and particularly how an industrial working class came into existence. Therefore, he did other things too. I won't get delayed on it, but I, I found the President's introduction provocative. He also gave the Barrington Lectures which were lectures about development in, in, in the west of Ireland. And it, he, he was very, very much, very much a, a progressive and ahead of his time. He was also a wonderful supporter of student activities. He went to on sabbatical to the United States and was rather peremptorily ordered back. And uh, I remember meeting him at what was the New Arts Building. I was auditor of the Literary Debating Society mm -hmm. and he had always been one of our judges. And he said to me, I'm only a few minutes back and you're asking me to do something already. But, uh, and then he immediately said he, he would. And he also uh, uh, spoke at my own inaugural address to the Literary Debating Society in 1965. The paper had the modest title, The Future of Ireland. <laughs> uh, but then... Uh, but, uh, uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but this year <clears throat> does mark the 50th anniversary uh, of the 50th anniversary of, of, the, of the founding of the Social Science Research Centre. It was founded by Laura Eustace O'Hedon, and my original involvement in it uh, was uh, to help finish, as I had been in the United States, and I'd come back and was to help finish a study on the port of Galway. I want to say a word about that in a minute, and uh, I did that. And then I later began work, uh, which was really unfinished work uh, on migration theory. But among those people who were there with us at that time, sharing those rooms in the social, in the grammar school, were PJ Drudy, who would go on to be the professor of regional and urban economics at Trinity College, and who did so much work on land politics and people in Mayo. Also sharing the room with me at the time was Paul Gillespie, who went on, who really was is now working so doing such f fine work in relation to the future of the European Union. Mihal Kineda was working on forestry. So the other pillar of it was geography, which Brendan McKay was setting off and was doing the, the Gaelton study. So you had people working in geography, sociology, there was some work, uh, I think David Thornley was actually supervising uh, Paul Gillespie's PhD at that time. Uh, Peter Drudy would later was going to go on to Cambridge. So that's who we were, and uh, these modest sums that were required, they were got just thrown together, and we got the space in the grammar school. But when I look back on it, I just want to say that uh, if this year then marks the 50th anniversary of that first attempt for the Social Science Research Centre, 
Uh, today we're establishing the establishment of a new institute for life course and society. And I just so want to congratulate all those who are associated with bringing this institute into being. Um, NUIG itself, its foundation, the state, uh, I think the foundation of that wonderful man, Chuck Feeney, to whom I had the honour a couple of weeks ago of presenting an honour, given to him by his colleagues, his peers, uh, on, on the Bay Area of San Francisco. I, I think when I look back to, in a way, uh, some of the problems, uh, uh, some of the problems that were there for us 50 years ago haven't gone away. Why, why did this kind of institute have to happen at what was then UCG? Well, there had been a, 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 the Freeze Report, and the Freeze Report was an independent report that looked at the future of economic and social research in Ireland, and it concluded the issue was uh, the universities didn't put up much of a fight for it. Uh, and it, therefore, it was decided that it should be established at an arm's length from the universities. And it became the Economic Res Research Institute that later became the Economic and Social Research Institute. I suggest to you that it is uh, uh, still an issue as to how close <coughs> inst research institutes should be to the state and where they should be in relation to universities. I was in Geneva last week and I was speaking to some old friends from the Economic Research the, the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, and they have been stopped doing fundamental research since 2002. Uh, they're still there, they're still doing some very, very high quality work. But it is interesting who is allowed to do research, who is commissioned to do research, who publishes research, and what is published. I'll come on to it in a moment to say it's a very, very interesting issue as to whether it is in the public interest that you would privilege only research that is published within a community of scholars, even though other research might be published in lesser publications to which more people would have access and you should have public discussion and which you could initiate change. That's an issue that was raised with me recently by the Sociological Association of Ireland. With very little... Ray what those who founded uh, the Social Science Research Centre all those years ago, with little resources, but they had far-seeing vision, they also had something very important, a capacity to cooperate with each other across different subjects and different disciplines. Uh, I think that, it, therefore, they were setting this up, uh, this response to a regional issue, in conscious knowledge, if you like. I remember Eustace Ojeda saying to me, no one is speaking about this freeze report, you know. It hasn't been discussed. And it still remains a fundamental issue, let me note it, as that one in relation to uh, uh, how, in, how independent is it. There's a bigger issue that uh, I might get into rather uh, is, is straight away that strikes me about this. And, and this is something at this moment, that, and my wish for this institute and for it to <coughs> succeed, my principal interest in it is in fact in its interdisciplinary character and also the fact that it is across all of the life cycle. Uh, these are very important barriers to, uh, to be crossing. What I do want to say, uh, and very strongly to say, that it would be disastrous if it was at the price of an interest in strong theoretical work. Uh, I remember very, 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 very much th how disastrous it was at Manchester University between 1968 and 71, meeting African uh, students and among others, and they would be said, wh 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 where are you? I have all my data, I'm just looking for a theoretical framework, <laughs> which is about nearly saying is that I'm looking for a jar into which to pour my material and so forth. But also there was this notion, and I think back of the important relationships that I had with the 82 families of Dockers that I interviewed in the time. When one is speaking to a family like that, uh, uh, you have a, a certain moral responsibility in relation to why you're acquiring the story and why you're responding to it. But there's always this notion, uh, a very terrible division emerged, I think, quite early on, uh, between, for example, sociological theory and social work. Uh, I think that was disastrous. 
I think it would be very disastrous if people, for example, on the social work side, decided to say something, we're the people who get on with it. We're dealing with the real families in distress. Whereas all those people are talking about theory, they just go on and on. Equally, in the same way, there is a requirement for people who are, in fact, developing theory uh, to, uh, uh, to, to put it to the test, to actually fit it into the structure of thought that is either acquiescing with what is at the present time within a system or has the courage to test it. And therefore, there's a, a first-rate question arises as well as to whether all of this work is to take place with an assumed acceptance of an existing systemic structure or is it not only going to strain that systemic structure, but also to talk about relationships between different systems, guided by different assumptions? Because it does matter whether you assume that the people you're dealing with are in fact individual, rationally calculating utility, maximizing, un maximizing units, or are they vulnerable people going through the life cycle as it is with different levels of need and so forth, with different levels of capacity allowed by structures to meet such needs and respond to them, take care of others in relation to families. These matters in relation, the great moment of this institute and its possibility is in its capacity whether or not it will be able uh, to end those false divisions uh, between practice and theory and equally between different disciplines, as important as the interdisciplinary work itself, because it has to be more than a depository of what interests the researcher of the time. I think the great strengths of the, I, I think uh, in relation to in the presence of the university, I say this, I say that the contemporary university has to continually redefine itself in conditions of great change while seeking to retain the best elements of tradition. I also think that the great strengths then of this new institute lie in its interdisciplinary approach. It's also its strong emphasis on civic participation, both as a methodology and as a policy objective. Now I've chosen some of those features just to make a brief reflection this evening, as I believe that these principles of connecting discourses between discrete spheres of research and policy formation and between academy and society are of particular importance and relevance to the wider global challenges we all face at this time. I mentioned that freeze report because that issue of where the fundamental research is to be located and what relationship it should have to the state or alternative sources of funding remains as an issue, as I said, just as it was 50 years ago. When sociology was introduced to Ireland, mostly in the 1960s, as I've said, social work was available only in UCD and in a combined form in University College Cork. It didn't feature at all in UCG. And for the record, I welcome the inclusion of applied work in the university's practice. But as I said, I repeat, I identify a principal problem right across the social sciences in the assumption that applied work must be the cost of good and groundbreaking theoretical work. I think that they need each other. I have said that twice for the simple reason that it is terribly important to me. But these challenges at the contemporary moment are not new. They, they include questions of how issues of development in global poverty, of climate change, sustainability, and of conflict and displacement are to be defined and approached. We find ourselves at a time in history when great change seems inevitable, but yet when all these separate challenges have combined and are urgent, are impacting together within the same time frame, they're also suggestive of a deeper issue uh, within our thought systems. That is of a model of separatism within the social sciences that leaves us with an approach that is not sufficient at either an analytical or policy level and in which essential connections between and within the different spheres of our social and political discourse have become fractured or even lost. I was reminded of this problem of fractured discourses during a visit to Geneva just last week. During meetings with senior United Nations officials from agencies dealing with human rights, the humanitarian crisis, displacement, development, labour issues, the crippling difficulty of being forced to address these interlinked problems from separate silos was repeatedly voiced. It was rather like you were hearing different musics that could never be combined. 
and each person was working furiously at producing sound from their silo. But at the same time, the wild had all of these different connected problems. An example might be useful. The languages from the different agencies were not trans... The assumptions that were guiding the different agencies were not transferable one to the other. If I might give you an example, for example, between now and 2050, 50% 50 of, the population, uh, of, the, of the population increase will take place in eight countries and sit in Africa the young continent already. And six of those eight countries are in sub-Saharan Africa. And by 2050, <coughs> 1.2 billion young Africans will either have a right to develop in their own country, have a right to live sustainably in their in uh, country, or they will first go to cities that have not the capacity to handle them, or to add themselves onto the stream of migration. So therefore, issues of migration, Issues of the wrong models of development, issues of hopeless models of urbanization, issues of food, global hunger, so forth. All of these issues are connected, but yet in a curious way, as people lost their nerve at the end of the 1980s about the role of the state, things broke into a kind of confusion, and thus everyone could be an expert on a special area and be worthy. Everyone could be worthy. But the point about it was is that the analytical, the capacity uh, to bring it together in a policy sense was being lost and was lost more and more. We had a meeting in the evening from the heads of all of the different agencies. And the good news is that from the front line, it is from the heads of the agencies, there was a, an acceptance of a need to construct new forms of partnership, all of which would gain from an interdisciplinary approach in the social sciences. So that is my hope that under this roof, in a way, we would be able to listen to each other with respect. It is a hard time for theoreticians, and particularly in political theory, where people, in political economy theory, where people simply do not enjoy the conditions at the moment of pluralism of discourse in so many parts of the world, a matter from which I have, which I have repeatedly uh, addressed. And I do so not in the sense of being cranky about this, but I think that it is simply, I admire good work and I admire excellence in relation to the development of instruments of measurement. But I do know the distinction between an instrument of measurement and the principles of method and the distinction between both of those and theoretical constructs. And really, in the uncertain world in which we live, and as we try to go forward and offer the best of things, and if you want theory to influence policy, and if you want the people who are the citizens to listen to the best discourses and exercise democratic choices, you must be able to live with the uncertainties of your own position, but put your assumptions of your theoretical suggestions on the table alongside others. That is missing, and that is showing itself in relation to the delivery of the work of the agencies, sometimes leading to alienation, and all of them speak if we must begin to speak with one voice as we are dealing with what literally is the agony and the survival of the world. And that discussion is hosted by our permanent representative to the United Nations, Patricia O'Brien, and attended by eight directors of UN agencies from across the human rights spectrum, the necessity of putting in place the new and revised inst international institutional architecture that would allow for effective coordination was made very clear. And it resonated for me with our challenges at the national level of responding to the events that we have experienced. In such an atmosphere, the academic community and our academic institutions have a vital role to play in developing the new intellectual tools by which we will find resolutions to these great challenges of our time, something that can only be realised by reconnecting the discourses within philosophy, the social sciences of ethics, economics and ecology, both in Ireland and at the global level. The questions that those who, are, who will work in the Institute will never be merely technical. Our issues are not techni. We will never, never need be about really relative efficiencies in services that are far short of rights. The response has to be immediate, of course. You have to be able to respond. 
but it can never be at the cost of recognising the right, perhaps, that has been denied. Should I just salve your immediate need, or should I have the courage to tell you that you are being wronged? These are the issues that are fundamental root issues, like they were 50 years ago, in relation to the source of instinct in the social sciences. And it is the distinction between that moment in the social sciences, which, for example, goes right through Giddens. I might ask you now, uh, where is the Giddens legacy in relation to the Blair legacy in relation to, uh, in relation to Great Britain? There is great merit in having moral courage, in being able to use your intellect in a way that is able to tolerate, but able also to analyse, and able to negotiate your way into new suggestions. And they're happening. There are different parts of the world where there are versions of the social sciences that are just wonderful to see in terms of their emancipatory capacity and the way in which they're being disseminated to populations in South America and Asia, and unfortunately not sufficiently in Africa. As President of Ireland, I initiated two years ago a national conversation about ethics in order to discuss the principles and values by which we might wish to live together as a society. In that first phase of the Action Initiative, our universities, including in UI Galway, hosted a series of seminars and events on subjects of ethical inquiry across all the academic disciplines. A wide variety of themes were explored and discussed with considerable focus on how our society is organised, on ethics within the domain of public policy and decision making, on ethics in the business and professional spheres, and on issues around diversity and tolerance. And I think it was rather clear to me that there were huge distances between the scholars as to their research and teaching interests and practices. At times, I could perceive a drift, as it were, towards acquiescence in a system that was contradictory of the intellectual and moral purpose of some of, these, of, some of the work. And for some others, it said, well, they didn't state it, but it masked a kind of unstated ideological assumption. So these issues are rays of fissures, as it were, between theory and practice, between different parts of scholarship on social, on social matters, they're not abstract ones that just simply say they are, they are, uh, they are I think, these discussions, uh, I think, were about how we could achieve an inclusive and pluralist scholarship in which students and scholars would have made available to them a wide range of theoretical frameworks from which to construct new models and the new tools necessary for this essential work of rebuilding and reconnecting. You see, if we are to face a challenge, like, for example, achieving decent work, if you are going to do that, you almost have to drop the word science, maybe at times, and speak of the word craft. People, when they say in ordinary language, he made a fist of it, or something like that. People are pulling out of the context of uncertainty different elements that will, in fact, for them, make something that is at least partially human. I think this work of rebuilding and reconnecting is terribly important. And I repeat, the dichotomy between grounded theoretical work and effective policy is a false one. From theory through method to the application and policy is a journey that can be reflexive and rich at each stage. That is a great opportunity for this new initiative. And I have looked at the work which is excellent in relation to the young people becoming researchers themselves in Tala and in Balaná. And what they're doing is that they're able to take the fullness of the person that they're talking into themselves and make a reflection on it. And that is what is important in it, it seems to me. It reminded me of a great time in the relation to the old United Nations agencies because all those people who came into the Social Science Research Centre 50 years ago, they're the people who provided the labour force for the extramural programme of UCG. And they set off every evening to all parts of the country, Roscommon, north as far as Letterkenny, east over as far as Atlone, south as far as Kilrush, and we were on the road all the time. Now, the fact of the matter was is that we were using literature like that had come from the Food and Agricultural Organisation, fact-finding with rural people. 
And you had people in Roscommon who for the first time said they didn't have to listen to experts to, experts to know what their agricultural production was. They knew what a pie chart was. They knew what line charts were. They knew how to do graphs and so forth. So there was an exercise of empowerment in that. And that raises a question raised with me by the Sociological Association of Ireland, and particularly for young scholars and young sociologists. Should they be able and encouraged to publish in literature and in places where people can have access to this and where it can make a real difference? Or is it, on the other hand, that they know that their future depends on a very narrow range of publication, and is it working against them? They are at the moment speaking to me, some members of the Sociological Association, about the consequences of a precariat emerging, which in fact will, in fact, for which they are feeling more than a little depressed. I think that getting that model together is a great opportunity for the new institution. Have a bit of joy in the whole thing, uh, in imperfection. I mean, this is the, if you would think in really what happens, sociology is a subject, and it is in very bad times. It's been closed down in parts of Northern Ireland. There's now only one place where you can do it as a full, to, full, full degree. This, this happens. But in many cases, you take about what happened, the great, the great 19th century sweep of sociology through Marx, Weber, Durkheim, and, and Tunnies, and all of the others. And you move into the modern period. When was it going very well? It was going very well when you had people actually linking their theoretical work to the welfare state. But of course, we, it is just dishonest if I said that everything wasn't changed from the end of the 1980s when you had such a, a dramatic at retreat from the work of the state. And indeed, those issues I mentioned in relation to today, as we discuss uh, climate change, as we discuss sustainable development goals in New York recently, and you look at where it is to be funded, and it is to be funded, let us say, from a sizable contribution from the private sector. Well, just ask yourself, do you think that sizable contribution will bring compliance in human rights? Do you think it will have the same energy in relation to human rights as the state had? So you have to be able to discuss the role of the state. But you notice a very interesting, even in my own speeches and the reaction to them at times, why do I give them? It is because I feel free to talk about the role of the state, but I also feel free to talk about the right to make a demand for plural scholarship. And it's very interesting, as I point out, about the differences between that time I'm referring to, 1968. People, for example, protested in Paris. They were mostly from sociology departments. And it was one of the responses of the French president to break up the French universities so as to make sure that it couldn't happen again. A very interesting time here. Edmund Dugan and myself were having a discussion. There was bad news from the coroner, from the president, to say that the person in charge of the cadets had said that all the ologies and the osophies were out <laughs> for students because basically there might be a cure. And it took us a kind of about four or five years to get back to sanity and, and where we were. But this, uh, I think, uh, I, I state it very acidly in a way. If you want scholarship, you have to demand it. And if you claim to be a scholar, well, then you must be open in relation to different paradigms of thought, different assumptions. And if you're a serious scholar in dialogue with another, you put your assumptions on the table. It's very interesting now, I go back to uh, more orthodox sources of all of this so as to make things helpful. I think that the second Gleon Declaration of Universities and the Innovative Spirit in 2009 had this unequivocally to say. It said that it is within your universities that the leaders of each new generation are nurtured. It is there that boundaries to our existing knowledge are explored and crossed. It is there that unfettered thinking can thrive and unconstrained intellectual partnerships can be created. It is there within each new class, within each new generation, that the future is forged. I mentioned 1968 in Paris. Very interestingly, in 1988, 20 years later, and you had a protest again at the Sorbonne. This time, it was not about a left-right divide. It was the students of the postgraduate economics classes came agitating to have their subject taught pluralistically. And they were joined by the postgraduate students in Cambridge. Therefore, pluralism in, policy, in education is an important ground value. I think I quite realise, I think that this role that I've just quoted for the universities has implications not just for independence as well, but for funding. 
It is a correct response to me to say, if we are to do this, if we are to be as that declaration stated, well, then we have to be funded properly. And that is a, a, great, a grave argument. If third level education is to facilitate normative assertion and change, it is essential that it be funded adequately. That is a debate that is ongoing. It is here in our universities that we can begin to enact such transformative thinking as is necessary to create the foundations of a society that is more inclusive, participatory and equal. That transformative thinking will require a real change in consciousness, in institutional thinking and will, I suggest, require a new form of contemporary literacy in the social sciences, which can engage and empower citizens the combination of constituent research centres at NUIG here, I think, and the delivery of engagement through the Community Knowledge I Initiative is for that reason to be very much welcomed. A key feature of the university projects brought forward during the My Ethics Initiative was their strong interdisciplinary emphasis, a reflection of the work of reconnecting that must be done, and a central part, of course, as it is, of the educational research philosophy of the Life Course Institute. There is work to be done in re-engaging young scholars, as I said, many of whom are feeling insecure in conditions of an emerging precariat. They feel that publication of contemporary issues in accessible form is not within the measurement system for career advancement. And then, too, is sociology, as I said, in some parts of our island is being closed down. But I'm staying positive by bringing together the fields of study research and policy in relation to children, youth, older people and citizens living with disabilities into one centre of research. Teaching and policy in this new institute, I think, will create a thriving focal point for the exploration of how solidarity can be built and nurtured at all levels of society, evoking both the universalism of human rights and the indivisibility of education, health, welfare and justice as areas of study. I came from a school this morning, which is a wonderful school, with young teachers. There are about 30 nationalities. It's in, 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 in Chantelin. And you look there at the moments that are achieved in which every child has an equal opportunity. And one asks, therefore, could this not be extended uh, into the society? The study that you're doing in relation to all of these different areas is very important. It's very important if it is the wish of the, of the majority to actually bring about the changes that will give every child a chance. That circumstance has yet to be created. The Institute, involving over 150, as the President tells us, academic staff, researchers, doctoral students, that constitutes a formidable resource for not just applied and innovative and groundbreaking research, but for real change. It is a community of research, teaching and interaction on in policy terms from which much can be rightly expected. I think another major feature of this institute, worthy of special note, is its focus, as I've said, on civic participation, both as methodology and as a social objective to be pursued for its own case. I think that there is a growing literature uh, on all sorts of new areas, one I'm very interested in myself is on the human rights of carers. Luke Clements of Cardiff Law School, for example, has written incisively on this subject. He writes of the reciprocal nature of carers and dependents and their rights. Such rights have immense applications for women, most dramatically, for example, in the developing world. What do I mean by this? If, in fact, you decide, if you give your, your time to being a carer, and if you are a carer and so forth, what are you giving away in terms of opportunities and, in terms, and does it not deserve uh, uh, to be recognised? I see the whole area of rights of carers as an area that, that, that will open up. But it raises political issues in relation uh, uh, to recognition of the task of caring and the placing of caring alongside other work and so forth. And for example, work that it might achieve the highest esteem is highly individualised. But the challenge now is to achieve and propagate a capacity to debate and discover uh, the opportunities for a profound understanding of all that connects the state, the society and the economy. 
I think that uh, there has been some very good work uh, from NUIG in this regard. I read with great interest, when I can get access to it, the theoretical work, such as Srinivas Raghavendra's work, uh, in relation to the nature of the new global economy that we now inherit, which is a a, a financialised global economy. Does it not? How could we go on and pretend rather like saying, to be like saying you didn't know it was raining? Uh, to know that the nature of the global economy has radically changed from being a productive form of capital to being overwhelmingly a speculative form of capital, with a ratio somewhere between 8 and 10 to 1 in favour of speculative capital rather than productive capital. And you might say to yourself, would you be a serious academic if you're serious? It doesn't matter. You can just, well, it does matter. And it is affecting people's lives all over the planet. And this is the idea. What do you do if you're a serious scholar when you're working in relation to that? You at least are conscious of it and you note it. And you get on with what you can. But in the conscious, honest affirmation of you say, you state what it is that you know. You have a responsibility to do that. I think that there are welcome signs that in the future it may be different. But I, I would say that the great founders of the social work perspective, such as Richard Titmus, uh, or even to Anthony Atkinson in the present day, were people, in fact, who had a, an approach like that, is where they began by stating what was the profile of the society and its assumptions and connections, and then got on with doing particular interventions. There are welcome signs of change. I think it's encouraging that next year, for the first time, a new subject, politics and society, will make its way into the Living Certificate syllabus. That new subject will enable the exposure of students to the thinking, I hope, of key political and social thinkers and the application of such thinking to the world they know and engage in, including sports clubs, schools and social media. I believe that that's a significant milestone, nurturing the ability of our young people to be reflective and proactive citizens who will be equipped with the skills to question and challenge decisions made by individuals and institutions in positions of power and authority. It can also, more importantly, lead to personal and community empowerment. The nurturing of an ethical conscience will enable our young people to think more critically, to challenge perceived inevitabilities. It is through critical and engaged pedagogy that we can be assured that we are educating a generation that will have the capacity to elicit the assumptions what is often falsely presented as an inevitability and to understand when those inevitabilities and their assumptions need to be challenged. A generation will have the confidence and the wisdom to engage in alternative visions of what a society can be, a happy and responsive generation in the best sense of their own terms. But transformative thinking must not stay on the pages of documents, reports and submissions, but must become a lived reality in our communities and in our schools. I really liked the two I saw from Balana and, and, and from Tara, in terms of the youngsters' capacities to talk about it. But they were heartbreaking too, and all the stronger for that, in relation to the one case, one uh, was what, the one in relation to Tara, was about people having difficulty coming out about their, their sexuality and the years immediately before they did, and how they did it, and so forth. And the sheer loneliness that was involved in, 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 in all of this. And then I, I think these are just, imp- that shows, if you like, that you can do this kind of research and it can be, be immensely valuable. I think following the path of my ethics initiative, a second phase was launched involving civil society. I want to just say a word about that because I saw it as a key part to, in, playing, in crafting a re-envisioned and shared future. For example, as part of that phase of the ethics initiative, DOCUS, The umbrella body for our aid agencies hosted a national process of reflection on Ireland's relationship with the development and developing world, recognising that global justice is a key ethical issue for our people. But you see, when I was doing that, and I saw that people would sign up to global justice, but no one wanted to do anything about taming the transnational corporations who were having extractive processes that were polluting populations, that were depriving populations in Africa and Asia and South America of needed income. In fact, it's interesting that Ireland at the Human Rights Council 
made four or five major gains in relation to civil society, in relation to youngsters, in relation to forms of nutrition. But on the very last day, it voted against a resolution that would, in fact, have um, made, asked for a legal instrument to come into being that would deal with the question of transnational corporations' ecological impacts. And the idea was we should wait until we have a consensus among everybody, and then at that stage we could move to do something. But again, when Eva Morales visited me, I spotted all, pointed out, for example, one case where a million uh, litres of cyanide was released into a water course, in another where mercury is used in relation to open mining and so forth. The issue is, in fact, not allowing words to become empty. If you are in favour of global justice, you must be able to face up to the tough choices in trade, ecology, mining, rights, workers' rights, children's rights, women's rights, gender equality, and all of these areas. I'm not preaching about this except to say the inconsistency is there otherwise, and therefore the future generation, you can't do it all in one go or anything like that, but you must at least be clear in your head as to where you must, where you want to, where you want to go. I also then, in the last phase of that ethics initiative, I dealt with the Society of St Vincent de Paul, the Wheel, the Congress of Trade Unions, and they started debating things. And most importantly, an initiative called Community Voices for a Renewed Ireland was undertaken in order to support a series of community-based conversations on how a more ethical Ireland could be fostered. As a consequence of all those initiatives, conversations began to take place which questioned our values, our assumptions, and the way we wish to live, and conversations which explored how to reform the economy, whose unquestioned assumptions and practical consequences had done so much damage to our society, our communities, and our people. And I can say immediately about this, I don't have any Luddite view about all of this. I understand the importance and necessity of fiscal prudence, of the importance of dealing with fiscal balances, of not adding them to debt and so forth. But I do say, in the end of it all, you have to ask whether or not you are pushing the rights of people, let us say, through a social floor into existence or not. I spoke at UNCTAD about, for example, three, three countries, Sierra Leone, Liberia and Guinea who are now all three paying more in debt repayments than they are able to leave aside to put in basic structures in place to make sure Ebola doesn't happen again. What do you do in a situation like that? It is quite frankly, to my mind, immoral to be requiring such countries to be, to, to, to be making debt payments. I think what the good news is that it is quite inspiring to witness the real will that exists to envision a new version of informed and empowered citizenship, and one that might enable all people to flourish. But I don't think we can assume that widespread support for an ethical society now exists, or that there is any uh, clear uh, that there is any clear evidence that there is a call that it is being called into existence. It is not so globally. I think you need great changes if you are to achieve this. Certainly in relation to regionally, in relation to Europe, the absence of a social floor, 56% youth unemployment in Greece, and yet one has to grind on and so forth. I think that nationally in the same way, there is a considerable merit in the short term for establishing social floors, which in fact meet the human rights uh, uh, demands. The models are already there in relation to the European instruments, economic and social and cultural rights. And you could then debate above the line, as it were. It's not me, I'm president now, so this isn't for me anymore. But I think that one of the things that I think that is, is uh, there's no clear evidence that equality is a major popular demand. And there's no evidence that there is a groundswell of support for a version of the state that might introduce equality. Since the 1980s, the redistributive state has lost support, as ever more ground is conceded to an extreme individualism grounded in a hegemonic version of the market without limit, even into areas of social vulnerability. One has to look at the obscenity of the strongest economy in the world with its privatised prison system where your chances of going to prison if you are a young black are about six times the right of getting to a third-level college. 
where you have, in fact, human rights being broken every day in the name of justice. I say all of this so as to give things a good start. The work of this new institute is taking place in a system that has an identifiable distribution of power. Ultimately, you will have to yourself looking at the face of power. It thus has to decide how it is to operate within and between different systemic priorities. And I know that the Life Course Institute, already so well connected with the work of civil society and with research in the community, will play an important role in connecting the work of the university with the community and ensuring that these central issues can be considered and examined in an open, pluralist and socially engaged manner. It is when such barriers are removed that the fullness of the discussion and how we might best use our opportunities can be realised. I think the concept of life course itself is valuable in its capacity to integrate existing work on different populations, but it is its, it is its capacity for integrating existing work in an intergenerational way that makes it perhaps most valuable. There's a possibility within the conceptual space that, if you like, life course suggests what it suggests may be a concept of crafting, crafting solutions that bridge theory and practice, crafting outcomes that are often the serendipitous yield of merged wisdoms and dis disciplines. Political economy, sociology, politics, philosophy are really crafts that take and manipulate materials from diverse sources. And thus the particular focus of the Life Course Institute on civic participation by young people is so worthy of special note. And I particularly pay tribute to the work undertaken by Pat Dolan in his role as UNESCO Chair in Children, children in Ch UNESCO Chair in Children, Youth and Civic Engagement. Pat's long-standing work in this area is very much in the spirit of that first initiative, those little attempts I made in my presidency, being young and Irish. A project that I remember we were trying to ascertain the views and visionary ideas of our young people, and we consulted with 800 of them. It was inspired by the belief that their act of civic participation would be the cornerstone of the real republic, which we must set about constructing. And as I pass on, note one point I just want to make, for, lest it might happen. It is not the case that we fell from conditions of, e of equality into inequality. We were never equal. We were not equal in the 19th century. We were not equal in the, in the state that we created in the 1920s. We were, there was as much a difference between the strong farmer and the parish and the people in the cottages as there was between any of the class divisions in industrial England or elsewhere. This isn't to say, it is simply to state a fact that it is not that we, rather than recovering our state of equal grace, it, was, it has all to be done. And that's the exciting part. It is that by looking at vulnerabilities and re constituting and recrafting the connections between subjects. You're able to say to people, you could have joy in every life. You could remove all the major insecurities. You could remove all the major sources of fear. And people would have time for music and stories and culture and all of the other things. If you don't do that, you end up defending. You can make an assumption as many leaders have in the world. They want what we have and we're not giving it to them. And you will end up with gated communities and violence and the mediating institutions will shrink in the middle. I think we are in, at a time where we can do this work together, bringing together good theoretical work with research work, with policy work, with informed and patiently delivered options in relation to different choices. All of this is possible. And I think to focus on just one of the initiatives that the UNESCO chairs worked in that will feed into the work of the Institute, I was struck, as I said, by the relevance to contemporary political events of that recent white paper prepared for UNESCO on pathways from extremism for young people. Pa academic work of that type delivered into the community will prove invaluable in addressing the complex problems of radicalisation among disengaged and disenfranchised youth. And isn't it interesting to contrast the military responses to, of course, it has to go between the, before the Italian parliament yet, 
Mr Rinzi's proposal to give €500 euro to every youngster who is in any one of these suburbs that have been in places where, there are, where intense radicalisation is taking place, provided that they spend it in a theatre or in a film or that they spend it in a museum or whatever. At least what he has said is that out of that two billion earmarked for Italy, what is proposed, one billion is for, is for security of a military kind and one billion is for culture, using culture. And there is such a thing as being able to create a society in which you have removed the scarcities and removed the fears and in which you will, you will have that kind of society. I think that, that is, this is a time I'm finishing of much understandable fear. In so many parts of the world, in the face, there are those areas where we have failed in relation to global hunger. 60 million displaced people on our planet without clear theories as to affect what rights does a migrant carry? Do you have to be sedentary and property owning to acquire rights? All fundamental issues. But I think at the present time it is of the greatest importance that at such a moment that our response is considered and focused on addressing the root and contributory causes of such conflicts, including those factors which lead young people to be made vulnerable to exploitation by extremist and criminal elements. And work with young people at risk of radicalisation is an important element in a considered approach. And I've seen that work myself in action at the Peace Centre, operated by the Tim Parry and Jonathan Ball Foundation in Warrington when I visited. A starting point for the work of that centre, and as is also recognised in the existing work of the Child and Family Research Centre, youth alienation must be understood in its social context. I think you are so right in the Institute to look at the whole physiological, the whole structure of what is happening in the in case of a young adult, and both the endogenous and exogenous influences and the settings that, and how they influence. In Europe, it must mean that we cannot begin to address the manifestation of youth alienation and disengagement without addressing the alarming levels of youth unemployment throughout the continent, running roughly at twice the level of general unemployment, which are in themselves unsustainably high. We have to face up to the task. Those who are conservatives and those who are in centre and right are looking on at the demand curve collapsing. There will be nobody to buy anything. Over on the other side, in the centre, and people who are egalitarians are simply saying, we should really be meeting the basic needs below a social floor. It will put money into circulation. And then after that, we can gradually make our way towards the decent and inclusive society. But these are real, real debates. And here is elsewhere issues of politics and justice. They can't be separated from issues of economic dysfunction. The Three Cities Project, for example, aimed at inclusiveness in urbanised settings, has the capacity in its training of researchers from the communities of youth, older people and people with disabilities to be a catalyst in the new forms of participation. That is important in relation to people having the capacity to conduct the research themselves and being able to think and to debate it. A truly functioning de democratic republic must be a place where citizenship is about belonging, about feeling safe and at home in one's world. It cannot be a place where housing continues to be treated as a speculative commodity, where workers are regarded as units of labour rather than citizens, human beings with rights and needs, where children or the elderly are accorded insufficient respect or dignity, where vulnerable citizens are marginalised and even regarded as being outside or even below the community of rights holders in our society. And where policy design does not, we must concede, ultimately, to recognise the requirement for social justice. I often think of Brother David in the Capuchin Centre in central Dublin, whom I visited lately. And there, every Wednesday at 8.30, 1,700 food parcels are distributed, and 470 breakfasts are served every day. And in the afternoon, 250 lunches. And a journalist asked him, and are you asking them, are they the new poor? Are they middle class? And he said, they have lost enough dignity by coming here. I give, ask them no questions. I try to help them. This notion, therefore, in case these are issues that can be changed. And we in Ireland, as we enter into the year, that marks an important centenary for our state. We should seize the opportunity to work together 
to create a republic of which we can be truly proud and in which we can all play a meaningful part. But at the very heart of republicanism, which we have yet to achieve, in its original sense lies the principle of participative citizenship, where the citizen as a carrier of rights is respected. To paraphrase the words of Amata Sin, to be truly free is to be able to participate without shame in your society and have your voice heard in the decisions that affect your life. A true republic will of course be judged on how it treats the strangers to its shores, on how it responds when presented with urgent human need and those fleeing conflict, persecution and oppression. That great dilemma faces all of Europe at this difficult and worrying time. A dilemma which will test the strengths and weaknesses of our different cultures. And we know that here in Ireland, we haven't always done well in this regard. And we have instances of where we have struggled with the empowering ethic of hospitality. In the coming months, we will all celebrate the centenary of the Easter Rising. And we'll reflect on the idealism of the words and vision and the legacy and meaning of 1916 and the proclamation. We should take this opportunity to consider the ideals which inspired those women and men who fought for a free state and a democratic republic. We should remember the courage and, yes, the utopianism on which the independence of our state was sought and in that process of rediscovery craft our own new vision for coming generations so that they might experience a real independence, independence from fear and insecurity and injustice. So as we begin the process of commemorations around the centenary of 1916, can there be any better way to honour the values of our founding fathers as articulated in the proclamation than by seeking a version of the state that meets our demands as a republic and a democracy recognising the importance of each individual member of our community and our duty and responsibility to play a role in the creation of a fair and equitable society? I have no doubt whatsoever that the work of this institute can make an important contribution to this work, and I wish it well.